service. Uh, we're going to start just reading Psalm 86 as our call to worship this morning. So in verse 8, there is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of sheep. So let's uh, just sing of the one who rescues sinners out of their misery by his grace. Still. 
Good morning. Welcome to Clearwater Community Church. We're glad that you're gathered with us this morning. We are in this series on justice and mercy, and we're beginning a, a quick study through the book of Micah. And so we will be using that as our text for the next few weeks. And today we're going to sort of introduce uh, these themes around that book, and we'll be getting into more pointed uh, detail application out of the text over the next few weeks. But we want to kind of set the groundwork for this idea from Scripture of God's justice and His mercy. Josh spoke of it coming out of the character of God last week, who God is, and we're going to see that played out in these opening sections of the book of Micah. Justice, 
from a biblical perspective, from uh, even our English perspective, deals with doing or receiving what is right, what is good, what is, what is just, what is fair. That, that's the idea of justice. We want to do what is right by everyone. Mercy, on the other hand, is receiving something good that we don't deserve. Mercy is when we receive something that we're not deserving and it's good and it works out in our benefit. We typically want mercy for ourselves, but justice when things go wrong or in in a way we are wronged. And so we want justice in that case, but we want mercy shown to us when we typically do something that isn't right. Uh, A week and a half ago, we were playing in uh, our last softball game with uh, the team from uh, a group of younger men, and I'm, I'm the old grandpa on the team here, but uh, this group of younger men from within uh, some connection to our church, mainly made up of these uh, young 20-somethings, and um, we were at this last game, and it was kind of an important game for us. We would have finished 500 if we were to win this game, and it might have even gotten us into a playoff scenario, uh, but this last game was a really interesting one. We were playing a team that was very evenly matched with us, and in the first inning of this game, the, the lights of the stadium just went out. Not stadium, but the ball field went out and the scoreboard and everything just went blank. And it took about 20 minutes to get everything up again, except the fact that the scoreboard didn't work. It wouldn't work for the rest of the evening. And so it was decided that the scorekeeper, this um, upper middle-aged woman uh, sitting behind home plate there who kind of keeps score and runs the scoreboard was gonna keep score herself. And then they would update us as to how the score was going. Well. As this game progressed, we scored a number of runs in the first inning, and then we didn't score in the second and scored a couple again in the third and in the fourth. And it was very interesting, though, as as we were scoring runs and really beating this other team, uh, the official score in my head at one point was 9-5, to and that agreed with what the umpire relayed to us from this lady who was keeping score that after the second inning, it was nine to five. That was the score of the game. Or after the third inning, I think it was nine to five. We scored a couple runs, the other team didn't. We came out the next inning and the score should have been 11 to five. And instead when we came out, the score was uh, 11 to seven. And we couldn't figure out what was going on with this score. We figured in the next inning, we'll get it figured out again. We scored a couple more runs. They scored a run, and the score should have been around 12 or 13 to 6. And when we came out the next inning, the umpire told us that the score now was 11 to 8 and that they had corrected everything. Well, you can imagine we were getting pretty upset at this because this was not the score. At some level, they had messed up the score, and because we couldn't watch what they were doing on the scoreboard, we couldn't verify how they were coming to these conclusions. And basically, we had to go with this scenario, and it was not the right score of the game. We were winning by more runs. We got into the last inning and didn't score in our part of the inning. The other team started to score some runs and actually tied the game up, and with two outs in the last part of the inning, hit another ground ball that took a ridiculously bad bounce on our shortstop and went over his head and they ended up scoring the winning run and beating us 12 to 11 when in fact even with that run scoring we should have still been ahead by at least two runs in this game and you can imagine when we walked off the field how upset we were and um, the other team remained completely silent during all of this finagling around the score they didn't ever want to admit what it was because they knew what was going on here Needless to say, at the end of this, we felt like a major injustice had happened to us and in our flesh wanted to really retaliate and and say something or do something. And then the reality of the whole situation set in and it's like, this is just a random Thursday night softball league. Is it really that big of a deal? Uh, But you know that feeling when you're wrong. You want the wrong set right. You want justice to be done. And the fact is, in this world, we're going to be treated unjustly at times, and injustices are going to happen. Uh, we're, we're fallible human creatures. Uh, but I want us to wrestle with the, this truth that um, while our heart desires justice, usually for ourselves, we still typically want mercy. And And it's hard for us, it doesn't come natural for us to extend mercy to others who might be doing something unjustly toward us. Today we live in a culture in which it seems like injustice reigns. And it becomes much easier, even as followers of Jesus Christ, 
to play by the rules of our culture and in the midst of injustice to sort of join in with that injustice in order to get ahead in life rather than to follow what God wants from us as his people. I think a lot of believers fall into this trap that it's easier for us to become a participant in the injustice. Uh, A great illustration of this is as a child, you know, that the teacher leaves the room, right, and, and leaves the class to themselves for a few minutes. Most students aren't going to just randomly start acting out or doing something that's wrong. But there's usually one or two troublemakers in there or one or two rebellious, antsy kids, and they start doing something, and then others start seeing that and seeing that they're getting away with it, and they join in. And it's easy to become a participant then in the rule-breaking because there isn't any justice that is ruling and reigning in that scenario. And we do that, and we fall into these same patterns. But what is needed in our day is what was needed in the day of Micah, and that was some people and leaders to stand up and do the hard right thing and stand for justice and rightness in the face of injustice. And to recognize that because of the injustice ruling in the land, what that would mean for them if this continued in relationship to who God was and what he would do. This stand for justice would finally culminate in the reign of Hezekiah. And we're told in Micah 1.1 that the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth came during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. And he saw the vision, a vision concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. It's during these men's reign, and so this whole prophecy takes place in a time in Israel's history where a lot of injustice was taking place, and God was bringing judgment upon his nation through another nation, Assyria, that would come in and completely wipe out the northern tribes of Israel and would bring destruction and devastation to the very gates of Jerusalem herself. How would God's People, his remnant respond to this. And I think in this prophecy, we see a number of things then about justice, about mercy, and how God wants us to act in our day. Two truths stand out about justice and mercy from these opening chapters of the book of Micah. And we're going to look at chapters one and two. Let's, let's read them quickly, and then we will comment on them. This is the word of the Lord that came to Micah the prophet at this time. Hear, you peoples, all of you. Listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple or his holy palace. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burnt with fire. I will destroy all her images. Since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, at the wages, as the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. For Samaria's plague is incurable. It has spread to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all, in Beth Ophrah roll in the dust. Pass by naked and in shame, you who live in Shafir. Those who live in Za'anan will not come out. Beth Azel is in mourning, it no longer protects you. Those who live in Maroth writhe in pain, waiting for relief. Because disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. You who live in Lachish, harness fast horses to the chariot. You are where the sin of daughter Zion began, for the transgressions of Israel were found in you. Therefore, you will give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. 
The town of Akzib will prove deceptive to the kings of Israel, and I will bring a conqueror against you who live in Marisha. The nobles of Israel will flee to Adullam. Shave your head in mourning for the children in whom you delight. Make yourself as bald as the vulture, for they will go from you into exile. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out, because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Therefore the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people, from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my, word, do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright. Lately my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes, and you take away my blessing from, the ch from their children forever. Get up, go away, for this is not your resting place, because it is defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for this people. The first truth that I see emerging from this stretch of text is this. Because he is perfectly just, God will judge people for their sins. Because he is perfectly just, God does what is right. He will judge people for their sins. In this stretch of text, God promises complete destruction and devastation for Samaria, the northern tribes of Israel. And he promises vast destruction for the cities of Judah, leading up to the very gates of Jerusalem herself. Destruction, devastation, God's judgment on these people. And the question that comes to us from a text like this is, is this fair? How is it that God can do this? How is it that God could do this even in this nation? These were supposedly his chosen people. Is this just? Is this fair treatment by God? So how do we answer this question? How can God do this, judge people for their sins? Well, first we must see who God is in this text, and then who we are as sinful people. How can God do this? First of all, who God is. God is what? God is holy. Notice verse 2 again here in verse chapter 1, that the sovereign Lord bears witness and he sees from his very holy dwelling place. God, you see, dwells in perfect holiness. His holy palace it's this residence from heaven above. He sits enthroned there. God is completely holy. He's transcendent. He's other than us. That's the understanding of holiness. It means that someone is set apart from. He's completely other than us in his being set apart from his creation. And at the same time, he is sovereign. He sees fully everything from this position, both the good and the evil that goes on within his people and within this earth. This holiness of God, who God is, he's holy. He's completely understanding and knowing of everything that is going on should be a sobering reality because a perfectly holy God witnesses everything that I do and everything that I think and everything that I am motivated by. That should bring conviction. At the same time, it's a comfort for us in our devastation, in our sorrow, in our own mistreatment at the hands of others. 
that God sees, God knows. And I think it's a comfort for us, even in the times in which we live. A lot of the Christians that I'm talking to, a lot of people in this church, demonstrate a worry, a concern, a a what does the near future have in store for us. And and as we look at the political scene and as we look at what's going on in our country, we can become worried about what does the near future hold for us as followers of Jesus Christ. But those thoughts and those worries should not consume a people that understand and know who our God is in His holiness and in His omniscience, that He knows everything. Because God knows exactly how this upcoming election fits into his sovereign plan for this world. His plan for your life and my life. He perfectly knows the future and how even the winners of this upcoming election fit into his plans for how he will ultimately usher in his kingdom. God sees, God knows from his holy dwelling. But the second reality of who God is here is that God is sovereignly powerful. We have this picture of the theophany that happens in verses 3 to 4. Nature itself becoming undone in the very powerful presence of God. The God of this universe entering into again his creation, descending from his habitation in the heavens to make his presence known within the earth once again. And when this happens, Nature itself is undone. Nature flees from God's presence. It melts like wax, the highest of mountains, and the waters themselves just rush down. When natural disaster comes, when when we know it's about to come, what do we as humans do? We flee from it. Just a few years ago, the threat of that hurricane that was so close to many of us who live in this area of Florida, what is it? It causes us to board up our houses, to prepare for it. And if we knew it was going to be a direct strike, and and even in the thought that it might be a direct strike, what happens? Lots of people flee from the area. They move away from it because we as humans can't control natural disasters of that extent. The California fires that devastated this summer areas of California There's only one hope to that, and that is to get out of your house and flee from it. When nature comes that powerfully against us, we flee. But here we have the God of the universe entering, and what do we see? Nature itself melting and fleeing from the presence of God. This is what God's presence does because he is all-powerful. And it's become commonplace in our world today to dismiss God or ignore him because we don't see him in such a dramatic way working and acting within human history. But as scripture promises us, a day is coming when God will re-enter his creation and his judgment will come and the earth itself will melt away in his presence. And it will be a time of utter devastation to those who witness it. Nothing escapes the holy presence, the sovereign presence, and the all-powerful presence and scrutiny of God's coming judgment. When nature's most dramatic features melt at his presence, I think that indicates to us that no physical or technological or military defense of this world will be of any use for humanity when the maker enters once again into his creation. You see, what Micah is seeing here is that nothing and no one can escape God's ultimate and just judgment when it occurs. God will hold sinners accountable in his justice for their sins. Why? Because he is holy and because he is sovereignly powerful. And lastly, because he is faithful. God remained fully faithful to the covenant that he entered into with Israel. He condemns them for their failure to remain covenantly faithful to him in verse 5. Israel broke their covenant that they had made with their God. 
while he protected them as their mighty God. You see, God kept his part of the covenant because that's what kind of God he is. He is a faithful God. He keeps his promises. He cannot go against his word because his very nature demands that he remain faithful to what he has promised. And yet their unfaithfulness to him would result in him enacting the curses of the covenant because, again, he will have to remain faithful to his word. And he promised that destruction and exile would come if they were unfaithful. You see, God's faithfulness to his word will demand not only his protection for his faithful followers, but it also will mean destruction for those who reject God or walk away from God. This is exactly what happened to faithless Samaria in verses 8 through 16 of chapter 1. Or verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1 and verses 8 through 16 of these cities in Judah. As the Assyrian armies came in and ravaged and devastated those northern tribes, they literally took piece by piece the walls and the foundations of the palace and poured them out into the fields so that nothing was left. The beauty and the splendor of the capital and the palace and all of what that represented was laid bare and shamed by the Assyrian army because Israel had rejected her God. You see, Judgment Day is coming because our God is holy and He's sovereignly powerful and He's faithful to His word. What actions would possibly result in such treatment, such utter devastation by God? What's the second reason that I see here in answering why is it that God will judge people for their sins? It's not just who he is here, but it's secondly who sinful humanity is. Notice the picture of sinful humanity that Micah unfolds for us in verses 5 through 7 and the rest of chapter 1 and then into chapter 2. The first characteristic of sinful humanity is this, that they are rebellious idolaters. In verses 5 through 7, as he speaks of the sins of Samaria, Israel, and Judah, Jerusalem here, and then points to the destruction of Samaria in verses 6 and 7, he points at this rebellious idolatry that stood behind what they did. All of this is because of Jacob's transgressions. Transgressions were willful infractions of the covenant. People knowing exactly what they were doing and what was right based on the covenant and deciding, I'm going to do what's wrong anyway. Because of the sins of the people of Israel, their their infractions and deviations and their own breaking of covenant. Israel had broken their covenant relationship with God as seen in the decisions and the choices that they were making. And this demonstrated that their heart wasn't committed to Yahweh, their Lord, as their covenant partner. You see, God was in a relationship much like a marriage relationship. It was demanding this relationship, this covenant relationship, was demanding of faithfulness on his part and faithfulness on his people's part to him. And yet over and over again, Israel was demonstrating that they were unfaithful to God by their actions. Israel was an adulterous idolater. And we see that in verse 7. The idols that you worship, these things that you give your heart to, and he describes it in terms of prostitution. They had set up cultic prostitution in their temple And now those same things would be enacted in this false religion religion of the nation that took them over. God would judge Israel by allowing destruction to come, destroying her idolatry and the religious system that she had given herself to. You see, at the heart of all sin, seen here as this sexual perversion, this prostitution, is this idolatry, where Something is elevated to the place that only God should have in our lives. Where we choose to worship and give our heart to something other than God. Something other than God is captivating our attention. 
We are choosing to worship and give our heart to that. And from Scripture, we know, and from the picture here, that our God is a jealous God. He jealously longs for our worship because He knows that all of these other things that we might choose to worship, that we choose to give our allegiance to, our attention to, all of those other things will only result in death for us because they don't lead us to God. They lead us away from God and to seek ultimate salvation in ourselves or in the things of this world. When we choose to worship or give our heart to something other than God, we can expect death because that's all that it will lead to. Our choices have real consequences. The wages, the payment, the result of our sinful choices is death. The choices that we made in the past, we know, some of you know this reality, that those choices still have lasting consequences to today. It's such a sobering reality. Rather than give our hearts to our own pleasures, our own seeking of things that we think can satisfy us, we need to make our choices and align our lives in submission to God and His Word, not to our own selfish desires. And in the end, as we see here, this will be the basis of our judgment. God will judge us off of these choices, whether we choose to follow Him or give our hearts and our attention to something else. In this system, as depicted here, other idolaters, other perverters of truth, other people of this world will eventually consume us with the same perversion. They would come in and strip Israel of the gold and the silver of their cultic prostitution and worship of these idols, and then take it back to their own temples and engage in the same process over and over again. You see, we as sinful humanity are rebellious idolaters. And it plays itself out in our actions as we see unfold at the beginning of chapter 2. It's the second characteristic that I see here of sinful humanity. And that is not only are they these idolaters, these rebellious idolaters, but we are greedy coveters of what others have. Greedy coveters. Woe is pronounced here because they covet fields and seize them and they defraud people of their homes rob them of their inheritance. A divine threat is pronounced against all of those who plot evil schemes. It keeps them up at night. This devastation of others in order to get ahead in this world, to enrich themselves. They covet what others have, and then because of they have the power to do so, they defraud their neighbor by taking it as their own. In this agrarian society of Israel of that day, it would rob the other individual of their very livelihood. You see, the inheritance of God was tied to the family and tied to the land that was theirs. And if you were to take that from somebody, if you were to defraud them of that, if you were to so covet somebody else's land that you would go because of your powerful position and then seize that from them, you would rob them of their very livelihood. This was played out in this exact time frame, a little bit earlier than this, in the biblical story of Ahab, right, and Naboth, where Ahab saw Naboth's vineyard and was so jealous of it that he wanted it, and Jezebel would ultimately execute Naboth so Ahab could have and take. We see the powerful just using their power to take and rob from those who were not as powerful as them. How do we apply this to our lives today? What God is after here is the heart motivation, the coveting. God sees the heart and he detests this attitude. What is covetousness? Gary Smith in his commentary on Micah uh, uh, defines covetousness as this, the attitude that I need something I do not now have in order to make me happy. Covetousness is the attitude that I need something that I presently do not have in order to make me happy. And this is not just a problem for the poor where the poor might covet because they don't have, but it's 
also very much a problem at the heart of the, the wealthiest of people. As if I had something else, that would bring me satisfaction. That would make me happy in life. You see, covetousness is at the heart of numerous sins, whether we are poor or whether we are wealthy, whether we have or whether we don't have. It stands behind a lot of the sins we commit because we desire what we presently don't have, thinking that if we just had that, that would make us happy in life. What Micah and God are pointing out in this text is this is a manifestation of our idolatry that we would so worship the things of this world that we would go take them or buy them or purchase them looking for happiness to be found there rather than in relationship with our God. How do we see this played out in our own lives today or in the life of the church? I mean, what really is credit card debt? I'm not talking about house purchasing debt or or even financing of something, that, maybe like a car. I mean, this could be the same thing, but, but credit card debt, where we are pinned under credit card debt, what have we really done there? We have bought things that we think we somehow need, not with money that we presently have, but with money that we don't have because we think that's going to give us satisfaction or it's going to make life more complete or we possibly could not do life without having it. All of advertising today plays off of our heart's desire of coveting things. It tries to put before us a product that says, you need this to make you happy. I enjoy golf, and this is exactly what golf club advertising is all about. The truth behind golf clubs is that they really have gotten to a place in technology where they don't change much. They promise that they can add more yards to your your hitting distance. But they've done test after test, and they show that if they set the club up just right and have the specs on the club exactly to the past year's model, those clubs pretty much hit the ball the exact same distance. But every six months to every year, the new club comes out. Why? Because it's, it's playing at our heart's desire that I need that new one. That's going to make me better, and then I'll be more happy in my golf game. And we buy into that and we purchase something that we really don't need. And ultimately, it's not going to make us happy because it's not going to hit the ball farther and it's not going to cure our slice because the problem isn't the club. The problem is the person using the club. You see, happiness isn't found in the things of this world. That's not the problem that we don't have enough stuff. Our problem is our heart and the covetous nature of it. How do we combat that? Rather than take and think that we need that stuff in order to make us happy, we need to foster a heart of generosity where we look and see need and we meet need by giving of our own finances, our own resources, our own time to help one another. And that's what the church should be all about. We saw that in our series through the Gospel of John. That we love one another, lay our life down for one another, serve one another. That fosters community, and it also combats this idolatry of covetousness that so easily dominates our lives. The third thing that I see in this text as this unfolds in chapter 2 here of who we are as sinful humanity, we are these idolaters, we are these greedy coveters, but we are thirdly selective listeners. In verses 6 and 11 of chapter 2, he speaks to the fact that we listen to speakers that are saying things that we want to hear. You see, when the prophets of God spoke against idolatrous and covetous Israel and Judah, the people dismissed them, refused to listen to what they said. In fact, they even called it into question in verses 7 and 8 there. The descendants of Jacob, and they say, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? You see, the false prophets of that time were saying, God won't judge us. You're his people. God won't become impatient with us. You're his elect. He couldn't possibly do this. 
They would only listen to those who would speak what they wanted to hear. They thought that God was only a God of love who couldn't possibly grow impatient with them or do deeds of judgment against his own people. Does this sound at all familiar for us today? I mean, we have people who in the name of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, trumpet the idea that love and the love of God will ultimately prevail so that he won't judge anyone in their sin. He can't possibly condemn people to an eternal hell. We have people pronouncing today that, that God only wants your best for you and your best is what your heart desires and God will prosper you and make you rich and give you your heart's desires in this world. It is true that God's word does benefit the one who truly obeys, but that benefit doesn't mean that we get what we want. Because at the heart of still what we want in many ways is this covetousness and this idolatry. But the prosperity preacher is exactly the right kind of preacher for the hedonistic nation that we have become today. And we gravitate towards that. This is why it is so important that we have a solid biblical foundation and understanding in our lives, in our homes, that we're talking about it to our children so that we can fight this natural tendency to read Scripture and understand God from our own preconceived biases of how we think God should act and work according to our culture and our setting today. There are still many of us who think that God has to bless us. I do so much for God. He has to allow blessing to come my way. We believe God has to be God has to want us to be comfortable in the here and now. If we pray enough and if we trust God enough, He will leave us comfortable. That if we drop to our knees enough and if enough Christians pray about it, that He will give us the candidate that we want elected on Tuesday. We have to lay a foundation that understands God at His Word and what this reveals about God and His future that unties us from this tether that we have to our culture and to our world that infiltrates even our own thinking and our reading of Scripture. The reality, folks, is, and this is just an application to Tuesday that's coming, in no way does our Great Commission change one way or the other, upon who gets elected to be the leader of our nation. We are still called to make disciples and to teach one another what Jesus Christ has commanded us. To live that out in relationship with one another. That happens whether our context is easier for us or gets tougher for us. That's the reality of what the Bible teaches. They were selective hearers, listeners, that's who we are. And lastly, opportunistic defrauders. They defrauded others, verses 8 through 10, to get ahead, to get what they wanted. How perverse has society become? Even our society today, that we excuse things like looting and defrauding as a just thing. That it's okay to rob from somebody else because those people just don't have enough. I mean, numerous politicians in our day today are justifying looting on the basis of our country's own system as if this is okay to defraud someone else. And again, I think this is much easier for us to see in others than it is in our own lives. We will condemn that in our culture and we watch it on TV and we watch the violence and the devastation happening in the name of social justice or at least rectification of social injustice. We, we, we condemn that. But it's much more difficult to see how we ourselves buy into and are willing to easily defraud others. Just think about it in relationship to the tax code. Whenever something's going to change in reference to our taxes, 
What is the first thought that comes into our mind? How does this affect what? Me. How is this going to affect me? Is it going to make my taxes go up? Am I going to have to pay more into this government? Or am I going to somehow get a kickback and it's going to benefit me? Our thoughts very rarely ever run to the idea of how might this disadvantage others or how might this hurt further those in need. I mean, this is the great appeal, right, of, of all of the, the way politics works and tax code works. It, it appeals to, to these base desires in us, and we immediately run to, how is this going to benefit me? Not even thinking about what it might do to others. These people were opportunistic and they're defrauding of others. God hates that and will judge that. The second truth that I see out of this text, and we'll have to move through this one quickly, is just at the end here. Because God, first of all, is perfectly just, he will judge people for their sins. But because God is merciful, he will ultimately save those who trust in him. Because our God is merciful, he will Save those who trust in him. Notice verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them. The Lord at their head. This is a vision of, of a promise by God of deliverance of his people, of saving this remnant that would be in Jerusalem as the very enemies and the destruction comes to the gates of Jerusalem. This played out in the nation of Judah as Hezekiah would repent of sin and call back to God and throw himself at the mercy of God, that God would respond by coming and utterly devastating and destroying the Assyrian army and delivering his people. Because our God is merciful, he will ultimately save those who trust in him. We see this in two aspects in this whole text. Number one, he has chosen to reveal himself in order that people might respond to his word. This is found in chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came through Micah to these people in order to bring them to a place where they would respond and repent. God chose to reveal himself in order that his people would respond to his word. God took the initiative to deliver a message of judgment and a message of mercy to his people in order that they would repent and turn back to him. And today, God still provides us with these warnings that we might respond before it is too late. You see, God is long-suffering. God is patient. He doesn't destroy us immediately because if God enacted his holy, all-powerful, faithful justice immediately upon sinners, we would all be condemned. But ultimately, God will judge those who continue to reject and rebel against him. God wants sinners to respond. And I see this amazing testimony of Micah in chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. What did Micah do when he hears of the devastation? It caused him to lament and cry out and mourn over the reality of the devastation and the destruction that was to come upon the wicked at the hands of a just God. And I ask today, as we see injustice, what is our heart's desire toward those, even those who have been unjust and are going to become the very objects of God's wrath? Do we gloat in their destruction? Do we want to see them come to ruin? Or do we rather fall to our knees and beg the God of this universe to show mercy instead of wrath upon people who stand condemned under his judgment? Do we want to see them saved? Because our God is merciful, and he wants any and all to come to repent. God has chosen to reveal himself in order that might, people might respond to his word. And I think in our day and age, people would respond much more if we were falling on our knees and begging God and praying, and they saw that rather than us combating them or trying to win an argument and opposing them. God 
God accommodated himself. He chose to reveal himself. We need to be those instruments that reveal this love of God and mercy of God to this world. But secondly, God remains the only one that can deliver us from our current distress. God remains the only one who can deliver. That's 12 and 13 of chapter 2. God would come, respond to Hezekiah's repentance, deliver his people, sending an angel that would wipe out the Assyrian army. Our only solution to our sinful predicament today is to turn and trust our God who is mighty to save. The main idea of this text is that we must take God at his word, that he will destroy all who reject him and save only those who trust in him. That is a sobering reality that who our God is, what he says is coming, although he is long-suffering, although he is patient, he will one day again enter into this universe and bring about the final judgment of this world. Only those who trust and turn to him will be saved. Justice, mercy, judgment, hope. Oswald in his comment or on an article that he has written looking at the book of Isaiah, but speaking of this idea of hope and judgment, speaks about how hope and judgment, justice and mercy go hand in hand. Listen to this. He says this, God will be just, and that means judgment, but he will be merciful, and that means hope, and hope comes through judgment. The hope here would come through the judgment of God in Micah. And Oswald points us to this reality. What else is the cross of Christ than the eternal vindication of the justice of God? The cross of Christ is the ultimate justice and judgment of God. But at the same time, it is also the eternal proclamation of the mercy of God. Why is that? Because on the cross, God judged his own son for the sins of humanity so that he could enact his mercy and forgive and make us his own, all who respond and repent, turn to him for our salvation. The holy, sovereignly powerful God of this universe will remain faithful to his word when he comes and he will destroy all those who are opposed to him. For us as believers, we need to have our minds on that reality. That should drive our evangelism. That should drive our concern for our lost family and neighbors. But it should also impact the way that we live, not to be tied to this world that is going to be devastated and ruined. Because as 2 Peter points out to us, at the final judgment, every aspect of this earth will melt away. Our covetousness of the things of this world, what a waste! Because the things of this world are going to melt away. Everything that we own in this world, everything that we will ever amass, all of the money that we will ever accumulate, the beautiful houses that we will decorate and adorn and live in, those will all melt to nothingness at the final judgment of God. This is why our hearts must cry out like Luther does in that great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let goods and kindred go. Let this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still because his kingdom is forever. We have to let go because the only thing that lasts is God's kingdom. We must be convicted by the picture that Scripture presents over and over again of a God who is completely holy, powerful, all-knowing, and just in his dealings with sinful humanity. Yet at the same time, this God desires that none should perish and all should come to repentance. He gladly forgives and saves any and all who will respond by repenting and turning to him. We know that truth. Are we living that truth out in the way that we order our lives, the decisions that we make, the way that we lead our families? Are we living that out in the way that we speak to 
our neighbors? And are we praying for the salvation of those who stand under condemnation of a just God? Sinners in the hands of a just God. He will judge sinful humanity, but he will save all who turn to him. May we testify of the salvation that he has brought to us this week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the power of the prophecy of Micah. And Lord, help us not to dismiss your justice, but help us to see those things that stand under your just condemnation. And may, Lord, we take a a real honest appraisal of our own lives and see if we are tethered to those things, if our hearts are idolatry, idolatrously greedy after those things, coveting them. And God, may we see who you are in your perfection and your holiness and your power and your faithfulness, and may that awaken us to this idolatry, Lord. May we confess and turn from that. I pray that, Lord, for any that might be listening that have not turned to you in their, for salvation. And I pray that for those of us who profess faith in Jesus Christ, that you would deliver us from this idolatry. Give us your heart and your eyes to see our culture for what it is. But, Lord, not to be those who stand in condemnation over it. We leave that in your hands. But to be those who lament and mourn and pray and then live out who our holy God is as a merciful God, ready to save all those who would turn and repent. Lord, use Clearwater Community Church, the members of Clearwater Community Church, the missionaries that are sent out from Clearwater Community Church to be those this week, this month, this year, for the rest of our lives that are living out the reality of the justice and the mercy of God as we seek to bear witness and then to teach who you are and what you've commanded us to be. And Lord, might you save some through our witness for your glory. We pray all of this in the one who's made this possible, the link, the salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in that witness, that testimony this week for God's glory. We'll see you next week. As we wrap up our time together in response to the sermon, I uh, just want to read Isaiah 40, a couple verses, and sing a song of response that is really uh, to help the church uh, bring our hearts and our voices together in a corporate uh, confession that we are prone to. Uh, uh, you know, there's some already today that we're prone to wander, we're prone to leave God for uh, lesser gods, uh, which is idolatry. And so because of the cross, because of Christ, we can draw near and uh, confess our sin without fear of being cast off or condemned. But the prophet Isaiah says to the nation of Israel, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. And, uh, again, the context is, is confronting Israel by idolatry. And so uh, let's just sing this or, or pray this together as we... Uh, respond to the word of God, that he would give us a renewed vision for his glory, um, grace to confess sin, a love for his body, his bride, and, and that our hearts would long for all of mankind to know the mercies of Christ Jesus.
grace to confess our sin. Renew our love for your body. Cause our hearts to long for the souls of men. Cause our hearts to two of us, and uh, may the holiness of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God compel us to go and live as his people uh, sent by his grace into the world. With that, we love you all. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.